really, I think it's such a privilege that I get to speak about the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. No better part of the whole scriptures, and I feel like the, the shroud has really helped it to come alive for all of us, including myself. I'll have to say that I was all day in preparation for this, and I, I just went out for a wonderful Italian meal at uh, Chianti's with mom and dad, and uh, I hope that the good Lord gives me the energy because I'm feeling very sleepy all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> so if I fall over, just pick me up and then we'll keep going. But the, resurre the resurrection, seeking the face of God. Um, I have to confess that I chose this as the theme because I felt like it's something I've neglected too much when it comes to the shroud. Um, I wanted to really focus on the contemplation of this face. And I think that there's disproportionate attention given to sometimes the science, especially the carbon dating, which in the end doesn't say a whole lot about the shroud, but so little attention is often given to just that quiet contemplation of this great gift that I believe God has given us. And I have to say, I have this image in my, my own room. It's right in front of my kneeler, and it's been that way for the last three years or so. And I can't tell you the number of graces that have come to me just by having that face in my room, in my presence, something that I constantly look at and come back to. And I can't tell you everything that it represents for my life and the great hopes that I have in my heart. And I imagine that that same experience is open to all of you if you, if you would do the same. I was just reading earlier today that Saint Therese de Lisieux um, said something very similar in her story of a soul. She says, oh, I can't count how many blessings have come to me because of the face of Christ that was also on her, on her wall. And so the resurrection Seeking the face of God. Let's see if I can introduce this with a painting, first from Caravaggio. This is the incredulity of St. Thomas. And, of course, you'll remember the scene. We, we blitzed through it last night because we didn't give a whole lot of time for John. But remember how Thomas says, I will not believe unless I put my fingers in the wounds on his side and his hands, etc. And then eight days later, Jesus comes and breathes on them and says, Peace be with you. Receive the Holy Spirit, right? Whose ever sins you forgive are forgiven, etc. Well, I, I love that scene with Thomas because he's the skeptic, isn't he? We even use that expression now, oh, what a doubting Thomas that one is. Because unless you give me empirical proof, something I can touch, something concrete, I will not believe. But you know, it's the skeptic who ends up saying, at point-blank range, right in Jesus' face, my Lord and my God... And nowhere else and anywhere in the gospel do we have such a direct confession in Jesus' divinity as on the lips of the skeptic, right? And so that's good news for us, just in case we might be doubting from time to time. There still might be hope that we'd come around to belief, which was exactly Jesus' invitation, right? Do not be unbelieving, but believe. And so many have seen that we are reliving this experience right here and right now when we come before the shroud, it's as if we have the opportunity to do what Thomas did. Do you see this photo mock-up? What's replaced Jesus' body? The Shroud of Turin. And now it's modern-day Thomases who are pressing and probing, and they too are confronted with empirical proof. Some sort of tangible sign. But then, of course, they'll have to choose whether they will be believing or unbelieving. And that's where the shroud brings us, um, to a very personal decision. And it's kind of where I wanted to leave our conversation to, that place of encounter, an encounter that happens not so much with material eyes, but with spiritual faith. So, the shroud presents a face which, when you think about it, really is an icon of the Paschal mystery. Because even though it's a battered body that we look at, if it's true that it's the fruit, the, the effect of the resurrection, well then, the moment the image is impressed is upon the cloth, 
is the very moment he springs to new glorified life. And so that seems to me significant because, you know, Jesus gave us only one photo of himself. And it's the one that encaptures these two mysteries, the incarnation and the resurrection. He took flesh so that he might die in our nature. In his own divine nature, he had no capacity for death. Right? But he became man so that we might become gods. Right? If it weren't quoted in the catechism, I, I feel like that might be heretical to say, but I know I'm on I'm sure ground when it's the saints that have said so. I think Ambrose and Aquinas say something similar in the catechism that quotes that. But this the divine exchange that my history is written on that linen from death to life, through the cross to the light, right? Per crucem ad lucem. All right, so I really invite you to go home with an image. I hope you have at least a little small picture of the image of the shroud, and I invite you to keep that close by, maybe on your, your nightstand when you pray, or um, maybe on your wall. And I think it will be the occasion for many graces to come into your life. The Truman Show, this is my little captatio, um, my little introduction into this theme. Um, when I was in high school, this movie came out. Can I just have a show of hands? Is it, who knows this movie, The Truman Show? Okay, not even half, wow. Okay, so The Truman Show, I'll have to explain a little bit of the story. So the, the story goes like this. This uh, Jim Carrey, the actor in the movie, is, plays the part of Truman. And his name is an allegory. He's the, the true man, right? He's kind of standing in for every man. And there it says, you know, he, he doesn't know it, but he actually lives on set. He lives in a world in which there are thousands and thousands of cameras everywhere, even on his ring. And so here he is looking at his finger. He doesn't know that he's being watched at every turn, but under, the, under a tree one day, he sees this young lady who captures his attention. And it's kind of like love at first sight. And he'll never forget her, even though they don't really have much of an encounter. It all happens very fast. Soon after, he's in the library, and he sees her, and he approaches her, and he, he says, um, you know, when can, when can we meet? And, she, and she's like, now or never. And he's like, what's going on? Okay, now. <laughs> There's, and so they go, they run off to the beach, and she's like, we have very little time. And he doesn't know what's going on, and sure enough, um, the supposed father of uh, this young lady comes in a car, like <laughs> driving onto the beach to separate this little uh, this, this, this rendezvous by night. But before he whisks her away in the car, um, the sweater stays behind, and uh, Truman hangs onto it as a keepsake. And he never forgets her. And so throughout the movie, you find him uh, increasingly dissatisfied with his own life. And he wants to travel, but every time he, he would muster up the courage to go off to Fiji, um, he's convinced by his friends, no, no, there's, there, you're going to get in a shipwreck. You're gonna, people die when they travel, you know? And so they're trying to keep him on set, and his wanderlust is growing. And besides, he wants to meet uh, this young lady once again. And so as at the end, towards the end of the movie, he finally gets in a boat and says enough is enough. And he, he realizes that the world around him is fake. And so when he, when he goes off into the boat, it's um, Christoph up in the, I don't know, tower. I think he lives in the sun or in the moon or something on the set, <laughs> looking down from above. And he creates this great storm to keep uh, Truman from escaping the world, uh, the set. And meanwhile, the world is watching, as always. And so is um, his, his girlfriend, as it were. And she's watching Truman get into the boat. And what does he pull out of his pocket as he's uh, on, on the ship? This a kind of pastiche that he's... Um, made from ripping out of magazines a nose, an eye, a mouth, 
something that looks like her. He doesn't have any picture of her, but what's been driving him this whole time? What is it that takes him beyond the sea into another world? The hope of meeting his beloved. And that strikes me as a really powerful metaphor. Finally, he, he crashes with the end of the, the world, the set, and his boat like cra- you know, bumps into the wall, and there he is. What is this? You know, and he steps out of the boat and onto this. And he, makes, he realizes that he's on TV, so he makes a final bow and says, you know, good, I forget what he says. He's like, good morning, good evening, good night, and <laughs> off he goes. And he's watching gleefully, he's coming for me, right? And so she comes running down the stairs and off to go meet him. Why are we talking about Truman? <laughs> because it strikes me that this is a really good, balance, a good background for understanding the biblical motif of the face, the face of God, which goes from the first page of Genesis to the very last page of Revelation. And there's something uh, very poignant about this, that what carries us through this life and into the next is a holy desire to see the face of God. This indeed is the deepest longing of man and is the fullest joy that we will ever know, to behold God's face. And we ought to have a little picture in our pocket that keeps us going when times are tough so that we can weather the storms that it, so it can reach that, that final port. And so, why does God hide his face? That's kind of the, the problem that we often experience, isn't it? It's like, God, I don't see you. My life is broken. I'm suffering. And you're not here. You're not speaking to me. You're not consoling me. You're far away. And We experience that in different ways, but that's the bottom line. Um, This is behind every single suffering, is that we feel God far away. We feel alienated from God. And so why does he act in this way, and when will we finally see him as he is? All right. Well, before we get into the scripture, I feel the need to pray. So let's ask for some help in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. Mary, Queen of Apostles, pray for us in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. All right, so with God's help, let's see if we can dive into something of a Bible word study on the face of God. Okay, so that's the theme, and now, um, with that background and with the questions that we've asked, we want to see what does Scripture have to say about an answer to this question? Because we're longing to see His face, it feels like He's hiding, and even many of the Psalms express just this longing. How long, O Lord? How will you forget me forever, the psalmist says? How long will you hide your face from me? Does God hide? By the way, the word for face, which is in red everywhere throughout this uh, slideshow presentation, is the word in uh, Hebrew is panim. You, uh, you might know Yiddish. You, have you ever seen a little baby say, oh, look at this cute little punim, right? So it comes, it's very close to panim. Uh, and, and it's plural, strangely, even though the singular is pane. It, they say in, in the plural, it means we translate in the singular. So, how long will you hide your panim? Sometimes we translate that with the word face, and then sometimes it get, gets other words like presence. In red, you'll hear the first instance, if I'm not, not mistaken, of the root word, uh, pane, is here in Genesis 3, 
when we have a game of sin and go hide, I guess you could call it, because ap after they sin, this is what they do. They hide themselves. They cover themselves. They feel shame. They feel alienated from God. Where are you? That's the question that had to come as a consequence of man's sin because they've created this barrier between them and their maker. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and man and his wife hid themselves from his panim, from the presence, here it says, of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Another translation in Spanish says, from the sight, obviously because on your face you have eyes, and if you're not in his presence, he can see you, and if you're ashamed of where you've been, that's what you're going to want to hide from. So all of the, this is richness for the, the theological consideration of this motif, the face of God. So too, sin will multiply after Adam and Eve. That ends in Genesis 3. What happens in Genesis 4? When the descendants of Adam and Eve find themselves also repeating the same mistakes. It's Cain who would kill his own brother Abel. And what happens after he, he kills, and his blood is shed there on, on the ground, and the Lord God says to him, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood. Does blood have a voice? It's personified, this blood. And now that it's fallen to the ground, it seems to be in relation to the earth. The earth is cursed, it will go on to say. The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Do you remember where we saw the word curse just before? Remember when Adam sinned and the Lord God said to him, cursed be the ground because of you? So too, just one chapter later, we find this, that it's not so much that the ground is punished as if it did something wrong, but these are the consequences of sin. There's a cosmic curse. There's, a, there's effect in the cosmos. There's chaos where there once was order. The paradise is now that we're going to see this banishment from in, and movement into exile. And now, it, that earth which gave forth its fruit, well, look what it goes on to say. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. There's, there's a broken relationship, not just between Adam and Eve, but also between Adam and the ground, the earth itself. It reminds us of Romans 8, right? That the world itself is groaning, awaiting for itself to be remade in the new Jerusalem. So, Cain, you shall be a fugitive. You shall be a wanderer on the earth. You're not at home. You're exiled from your home. You're in, not, you're in a place of chaos. You're a fugitive and a wanderer. My punishment is greater than I can bear, Cain says to God. Behold, you've driven me today away from the ground and from your panim. I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Is, is this true? Well, we don't really know, but it's what Cain thinks to be true. He thinks this is his punishment, that he shall, that from now on, uh, he, he won't see God's face. It's interesting because Adam and Eve hid themselves from God's face. He certainly goes too far when he says, Everyone, anyone who finds me will kill me. The Lord God says, no, not so, Cain. If anyone kills you, vengeance shall be taken on that person sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest anyone who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the panim of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So in any case, the consequence of sin is certainly this alienation from the earth from each other, Adam and Eve, Cain, Abel, and now, most importantly, alienation from God. Separation from is, is, the, is what happens when sin takes place. And so God, if he's going to deal with sin, he's going to have to deal with these consequences. All right, let's follow this motif to see how it gets resolved. In Genesis 6, corruption and violence spread all over the earth, so much so that the Lord God repents of having made it. And he says, we're going to start over, reset, reboot, let's have a great flood. 
and only a small remnant, right? Noah and his family go on the ark, a symbol of the covenant of God, a symbol of the future church, a type, if you will, of the future church. And so God's going to raise up um, a new people, um, but in this way, he sends a flood over the earth. Look at the language we find in Genesis 6, 11. Now, the earth was corrupt in God's panim, in God's face, we translate, in God's sight. And the earth was filled with violence. So corrupt to the face is what's literally being said. In other words, relationship is what's being expressed. And that relationship is being broken. Fast forward through Genesis. We've seen Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah now. We move to Abraham. Abraham receives promises, doesn't he? Even raised to a covenant, right, in Genesis 17. And he is told uh, um, to, that he will have descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, that he will be a blessing to all the nations of the earth, right? But look at this one particular verse. The Lord God says, I am God Almighty. Walk to my face. Lifne. It's a preposition. <laughs> Before is literally to the face of. This works better in, in Italian. They say davanti, like in front of. Right? In Spanish, they have a wonderful expression, like to walk cara a Dios, right? Face to God. Right? So to, to walk before me is to walk before my face, to the face. And what does that mean? He goes on to explain. Be blameless. In other words, know in whose presence you stand. You know, it's like, <laughs> I remember, I don't know why this just popped into my head. Uh, when I was in my first year, no, second year of novitiate, one of, the, uh, one of my confreres would tell me the story of how his, when he was a boy, he would pray in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And at one time at Mass, he, he, find, he found himself just doing it again and again. And his mom, like, looked at him, what are you doing? He was like, well, I can't, I can't remember. Is this the one to end the prayer or to start the prayer? And he was like, just when I thought I, I, I did the closing one, I, no, I, I think I'm still in the presence of God. I, like, I want to shut down. <laughs> How do I do it? And he was like, I feel like I'm always in the presence of God. And she was like, duh, <laughs> yeah, that's the whole point. You're always in the presence. There's, there's a book by Brother Lawrence. It says, practicing the presence of God, or to know that God is in the room. And when you know that, hopefully you'll walk blamelessly. You'll live accordingly, that, according to the covenant. That's what I think is being expressed in Genesis 17. Fast forward to Jacob now to see where the face occurs there. This would be a long episode, but it's, I, I wish we had time to go through the whole Jacob cycle. Really interesting. Remember how he comes out of the womb? He's a twin brother, but he wanted to get out first, and he couldn't. He comes out grabbing the heel of his big brother Esau, and so they name him the heel grabber. That's what his name means uh, on one etymology that's given in the scriptures. Apparently, he's one who's constantly seizing, seizing blessings for himself. Even when he's not the firstborn son and he wants that birthright, what does he do? He tricks his brother out of it with a bowl of porridge or porridge, is that the word? Stew or something? <laughs> uh, in, in any case, the, uh, he's constantly one to... Mm, to deceive. His name actually means, is given two etymologies in the scripture. One of them is to, to Jacob means to, to deceive. He is the deceiver. That's his name. Curiously, God changes his name, doesn't he? Jacob becomes Israel. When does, is his name changed? Right here. When he wrestles with the angel of God who turns out to be the Lord himself, actually. And so he renames this place where he wrestles with, with God, Peniel. You can even hear it. El, like Elohim, means God, right? El, Elohim. So uh, Pen comes from Panim, face. Peniel means face of God. Why do you name it that? Because at that spot, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been, has been delivered. Why? Because the assumption was, if you see God, his holiness is so great that should man come into that presence, 
would just be consumed, right? Like, like a drop of water in the presence of the sun, just sizzle right up. And yet, he sees the face of God and lives. And he marvels at that. So, this it creates this tension throughout the scripture. Can we see the face of God? Yeah, in Genesis, we did. We walked with him in the cool of the day. But ever since we sinned, we were banished from that garden. We were alienated from him, and that communion was lost. Would we ever get back to that? Jacob doesn't think it's possible. But Jacob will go through a long and gradual restoration. He's not just alienated from God. He's also alienated from his brother, who he tricked out of the birthright. Right? What's his name? Esau. And in Genesis 33, they finally are reconciled. And there's this beautiful embrace. Um, he, do you remember this? He, he, was, he has this big, long caravan of like sheep and gifts that go in, ahead of him. And now he's limping, right? Because ever since he wrestled with that angel, his hip socket got this, he, he, had to, he couldn't walk around normally. I guess that there goes his plan for running away from Esau should Esau turn violent, right? He's got to come back to him in humility and in fragility. And that caravan of, of gifts going just to kind of soften his, his brother before he actually gets there, after what he Jacobed him so many times, he deceived him. Well, now Israel comes back. The word means he who has striven with God. Well, Jacob's learned a lot at this point, and they embrace. Esau takes him back, and his brother Jacob says, for I have seen your face, which is like seeing the face of God, and you've accepted me. Please accept my blessing that is brought to you because God has dealt gracious with me and because I have enough. Is this Jacob talking? The heel grabber, the Caesar, the one who seizes. <laughs> is he satisfied? I have enough? What a conversion we see come about in him, little by little. Not a, he's a very flawed character, of course, Jacob, but he teaches us something because there's a, a Jacob in all of us. He who would seize material goods and, and fail to trust that God would be provident father and that he would provide with great abundance if we would just trust. The face of God is related to the face of our brother and that seems to be intentional in Genesis. All right, fasting forward to Exodus. In Exodus chapter 3 is where we go to Mount Horeb and Moses his name is called from the burning bush, Moses, Moses. And he says, I am the God of your fathers, right? Um, and Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look, to look at God. As he's apparently of the same mind as Jacob. No one can see the face of God and live. And God is now speaking to him from this burning bush. No wonder he's afraid. Look how this motif continues in the Moses cycle. At the end of the book, remember Exodus 32 is the golden calf. And, and there they are saying, before this idol, behold the God who brought you out of Egypt. While Moses is up on the mountain, seeing God face to face, talking to God face to face. And when he comes down, of course he finds them in this idolatry. In the very next chapter, this is what we read. That the, the, the Moses goes into the tent of meeting, right? The ohel moed. The ohel means tent, and it's the tent of encounter. It's the place of communion, this tent, this tabernaculum, if you want to use a Latin word. It's a tabernacle. It's a tent. And God, and Moses communes with God face to face at this spot. And this is what characterizes Moses. Which prophet is he? The quintessential prophet. The one who speaks to God face to face. Ask the Jews to this day, and they will say that of all the prophets who've come, you know, Isaiah, Daniel, I mean, uh, minor or major prophets, the, the best of them all, the most privileged, is Moses. Because he spoke face to face with God. He, he was called God's friend. And so in Deuteronomy 18... Oh, I don't have that slide next, but I guess it's coming right up. There's going to be a promise about a Moses who is to come, a prophet like Moses. But first, the end uh, of this Moses cycle in Exodus 33. This is 
perhaps the longest passage that I'll show you, but I think it's so important for prepping for Jesus, right? Because can man see the face of God? This is exactly the question that stands behind this chapter. Moses um, says, please show me your way. Of course you would want to pray that. Look, you brought me out of Egypt, and now this plane is completely flopped. These people have gone back to, you brought them out of Egypt. The hard part is getting Egypt out of Israel, right? Um, that's a line from Scott Hahn that's worth, that's worth keeping, right? It's easy to get Israel out of Egypt. What's harder is to get Egypt out of Israel, right? So show me your ways, he prays, that I, that I may know you. In order, that, in order to find favor in your sight, consider too that this nation is your people. You know, you led them out. Come on, what, are you going to abandon them now? And God confirms him, my panim will go with you, and I will give you rest. Well, that sounds reassuring, but apparently Moses isn't buying it because he comes back and says this, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. In other words, look, if you're not serious about this, don't go playing games with me, okay? <laughs> For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Because it doesn't seem like your plan is um, working out just as I expect it. But sure enough, uh, God continues to confirm it. Is it not in your going with us? Oh, this is Moses still. Moses continues, is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct? I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth. Oh, that it strikes me as very important background for the New Testament. What is it that sets Israel, God's firstborn son, um, as distinct from all the rest of the nations? God goes with them. I am who am, likely in Exodus, means I am with you. I go with you. Go, go tell that, right, to Pharaoh. I am who am. So this is what sets Israel apart. This was make them distinct, that God is with them. And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. See the language of relationship? To know God. If you know his name, it's precisely that you can call on him. When you're in an amusement park and, and you lose your kid, right, you can cry out their name and they'll hear and respond. And this is precisely why in exorcism, it's important to know the name of the demon, right? Because to know the name is to have authority over the other one, to call, to invoke, and to then cast out. God could stand in relation to his people. He who is transcendent, this is a very different conception of God than, than say Allah, right, who is master, and we are but, but slaves. No, a God who reveals his name is a God who can be called upon, a God who can be abused, which is why one of the commandments is, thou shall not use my name in vain. All right, so as we continue, Moses asks for a little bit more. I know you give me your name, Lord. I know you've given me these promises, but show me your glory, he goes on to say. Do you think he could actually receive such a gift? Well, look at what God comes back. I will make all my goodness pass before you. He asked to see glory. But he says, okay, well, here, how about this? Um, you'll see my goodness pass before you. I, and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. I'll show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But you can not see, see my panim. Sorry, can't get that good. Because man cannot look upon God and still live. You know that story, Moses, right? Jacob knew that. Um, all, all the others too. And so, can we ever see this face? The, the he, he, God goes on to say, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until all... I have passed by. Notice the parallelism here. See those colors that match? My glory is going to pass by, but then he slips and says, what's going to pass by? I will pass by. It seems that glory is nothing other than a proxy, a substitute for God himself. 
to see his glory is to see God. I will pass by. My glory will pass by. Exactly. So what's going to happen? Is he going to see? He, he seems like he's promising a revelation, but then he also adds this. I will cover you with my hand. Is this revelation or is this veiling? It's something like God, when he reveals his name, I am who am. Like, thanks for telling me your name, but what kind of name is that? <laughs> it's, like, it's like God sharing his name and yet obscuring it at the same time. There's mystery. And, you know, a lot of people misinterpret that word. They assume that we mean by mystery something that is completely in the darkness. No. When you look to the sun in broad daylight, if you stare straight at it, your, your eyes will hurt. Why? Because you see nothing? No, because you see too much. You can't take it in. So what happens when a transcendent God makes a revelation to mere creatures? It blinds us. It's like you when you wake up in the morning and the light is so strong, it, it hurts your eyes. You need to slowly come into that fullness. That's what a mystery is. Not God who is hiding himself, but revealing to us who are still weak. And so, what happens? Uh, God says, I will take, you, take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face you sh sh shall not be seen. Again, see how he's going to... I'm going to show you something, but just my posterior. That's the word that's used in Latin, and it becomes a motif in the, lit in the painting when they show God from behind. Have you ever seen the Sistine Chapel? Right, so it shows God's rear end. Some people were scandalized that, and Michelangelo was like, right there in the Bible is what it says. <laughs> so, um, that, was, that was Exodus. When we get to Deuteronomy 18, we, this is of course towards the end of Moses' life, and he gets this promise. He tells the people, it's Moses speaking, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Okay, when does, is the prophet like Moses come? Who else sees God face to face? Who is his friend? This is precisely why the Jews think that, the Mo that Moses is the greatest of all prophets because all those other prophets, they never had such a privilege. Do you know that this is the beginning of the gospel? John, they ask of John the Baptist, who are you? Are you the Messiah? Are you the prophet? Go check out John 1, 21. How about John 6, after the bread of life discourse? What do they say? This is indeed the prophet. Which prophet? The prophet like unto Moses. The one who sees God face to face the one who reveals his name. Okay, so that's background. I'm going to pause our biblical reflection to insert a, a little tidbit about Saint Thérèse de Lisieux, as she's often called. But you know her name in religion was Saint Teresa of the Child Jesus, as many know her. Many leave out the full name. Her full name, coming into religious life as a Carmelite, was St. Teresa of the Child Jesus and of the Holy Face. Okay, so the Pope at the time um, actually gave a special indulgence to a prayer. and There was a confraternity, a devotion to the Sacred Heart, to the Sacred Face. And so here she is depicted with the Child Jesus and the Face, uh, and it's the, pa the Christ in his Passion. And she had this displayed. She actually had a drawing in her um, own... No, I don't know if it was a cell or just the, the convent. And she wrote this beautiful prayer. It's kind of long, but I have just a portion of it for you. It's beautiful. I actually have it on my door next to the image of the shroud. O oh, adorable face of Jesus, sole beauty which ravishes my heart, vouchsafe to impress on my soul your divine likeness. O oh, my beloved, for love of you, I am content not to see here on earth the sweetness of your glance, nor to feel the ineffable kiss of your sacred lips, but I beg of you to inflame me with your love so that it may consume me quickly and that soon I may behold your glorious countenance in heaven. And you see how the face of God was more than artwork for her, 
but is truly a spiritual, um, a, a spiritual paradigm. It was like a, a motto for life. It was something that guided her whole spiritual journey. Oh, adorable face. May what I see be reflected upon me. So when you look at me, you, you see nothing but your image. Inflame in me the fire of your love so that I might reproduce in my face uh, the beautiful face that I behold. And I think that's why we need this in our spiritual lives too. Someone asked a great question last night, you know, why in our churches do we not have the resurrected Lord instead? Many times it's the crucifix. And I think part of it is because we find divine love shining most radically through the suffering face of Jesus, knowing that it's destined for glory. But a God who would have the final victory in resurrection is the same God who endured all of this. And they shall look on him whom they have pierced. Do you know that that was what Jesus himself quoted? Or it's when he's in the Passion, in the Passion narrative, we get a quote of Zechariah. They shall look on him whom they have pierced. In others, they shall contemplate divine love. And when they do, Jesus says, I will draw all men to myself when I'm lifted up. This is what draws the human heart. But we have to contemplate this face. All right, so back to our Bible word study. To see now, in, from the Old Testament, we'll segue into the New, but first I want to pit stop at the Psalms because it's David's Psalms. Uh, oh, I forgot I had Song of Songs because um, Song of Songs is, of course, this great um, marriage. It's the beloved, it's the groom and the beloved that right from the first chapter are seeking each other. And just when you think they're about to embrace, well then, uh, she, she, it's, she desires her beloved and he's not there. He's like a stag on the mountains and there she is chasing after him. And you think they, they come together and then no, it, and it, it and ends unresolved. It's never like, and they settle down happily ever after. No, it's this quest. And it's, it's of course, an image of God's love for his people. A God who would betroth uh, his, his, his covenant people. And so in chapter one, we get this. Um, an instance of that word panim, faith. The bride says, Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. O, o my dove, in the clefts of the rock, oh, that sounds familiar, in the crannies of the cliff, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. And so I'm, I'm reminded too of, of the Truman Show. As, as, he, as he loses his, the face of his beloved, he, he longs to see it again. And this is, uh, of course, an, an image for um, the, the covenant people that's not home yet. We're longing for that nuptial embrace, and it's still on the horizon. Okay, I won't give you all the way through the Song of Songs, but notice how this desire is taken up in many of the, the Psalms. For example, in Psalm 4, there are many who say, who will show us some good? Which good? Well, lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. It's interesting. What popped into my head just now is actually the real-life story of Jim Carrey. He shared his testimony. I don't know if any of you have heard, but, you know, if ever there was a successful actor, it's Jim Carrey. He said, I wish all of you would have what I had. I have everything I ever wanted, and it left me unsatisfied. It's kind of like that, that song from you 2 you know, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. How many, how, many, how many times do we need to hear the same story, and yet we all want to go down the same route? If only I had that car, if only I had so much money, if only I had that vacation home, if only I had this or that, then I'd be satisfied. No. If we don't have the face of God, no matter how much wine and grain we have stored up, we'll never be truly happy. You've given, you've filled up my heart. Let the light of your face shine upon us. That's the, uh, that's the fullest joy. In Psalm 16, this is impor important for resurrection. This is exactly the psalm they'll quote at Pentecost. It's Peter in chapter 2 of Acts of the Apostles who quotes this one um, because it has that little line about, you shall not let your beloved see corruption. 
Paul goes on to say, you make known to me the path of life in your panim, right, in your face, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Where's the fullness of joy? When we come into the face of God. All right, one more psalm. Psalm 17 can also be reread Christologically, right? Just like Psalm 16, we can, we can read it as the Old Testament people did, or we can reread it in the light of Christ and see how it has a whole new layer of meaning opened up. So, as for me, don't you like that picture? Look at that little baby waking up. <laughs> as for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. When I awake, when? Just from sleep or from the sleep of death? Right? At the sleep of death, we'll come into eschatological satisfaction. <laughs> I'm sure that's what's on the mind of that little baby. Eschatological satisfaction. <laughs> but it's what we're all looking for. You know, the, the, the great... I, I don't know what's waiting for us in, uh, in eternity, but I'm expecting a lot of fireworks, a lot of glory. And yet, we don't have language for this. Right? And so we use images. One of the most important, in my, to my mind, is seeing the face of God. All right. But it's not for everyone. It's a reward for those who are worthy. There are many expressions that are similar to this one. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. So it's the righteous ones who see God face to face. It's not everyone. Remember, Jesus will say, He'll cast out into the darkness where there is grinding of teeth, right? Far from God, far from a place of communion. Of course, it's an image. It's metaphorical language. But the essence of hell is separation from God. All right. This is um, Psalm 24. And the point here is to see that it's in the temple where Jews believed to see the face. Okay, so look how this goes. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, the temple, all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. To inquire means to seek after, right? Um, in the temple. All right, where do we see God's face in the temple? Keep reading, verse 7 and 8. You have, you have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. So it, it, it'd be interesting to, to pause at all of the details about the, the feasts of Jerusalem, but what they would do is bring out the menorah, They'd bring out the appurtenances, the furniture inside the temple, and to look at that was somehow to see the face of God. You know, it was only um, certain of the Levites who had the responsibility of touching the vessels that were associated with worship because they were consecrated. They were set apart for a holy purpose, and not anybody could touch them. You could touch them and die if it wasn't your role. And so what is it to see God's face? to look upon the Ark of the Covenant, to look upon these vessels that was somehow associated with, mysteriously, we might say sacramentally, to seeing God himself. All right, so if you were a Jew, where was the quasi-material presence of God? Where would you see his face? In one spot, in Jerusalem, in the temple. That's where God's face dwells with his people. That's where we need to seek him. You can imagine why that's important background for us. We've arrived to John chapter 1, and we have a pitching of a tent in the very first verse, right? The first verses of John chapter 1. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. That's what it really says. Skene means a tent. This verb is skeneo. Literally, he pitched a tent among us. God is making a new tabernacle, a new temple, and it's the word made flesh. And so he goes on to say, 
we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We can see God's glory where? In the incarnate Son of God, in Jesus himself. And so glory, as one of you, you asked, if I had to pick one little definition, it's a very tough concept, but this is what I would say. Glory is the divinity shining through humanity. So in Christ, the divinity isn't hidden as he takes flesh. The divinity is revealed through flesh. And that's so important for us. It's also a great analogy for you when you're reading the scriptures. Because just as the word of God isn't hidden just because he takes on human form, so too the divinity shines through human words. It's a divine word, and yet we, how do we access it? Through human words. That's glory. Divinity shining through humanity. And so at the opening verses of the Bible, we get a quote from Isaiah. This is right in Mark 1, verses 2 and 3. It's also at the beginning of Matthew. It's a quote that gets placed on the lips of John the Baptist, right? He is this messenger in the wilderness. Remember this line? This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare, before your, who will prepare your way before you. Or so it reads in Matthew chapter 1. Oh, is it 11? Yeah, it's 11. That's when uh, John the Baptist is in prison. I forgot. Um, in, in Mark, it's right at chapter 1, but in, in Matthew, it's chapter 11. Um, in any case, what's important is the difference between Isaiah and, God, and the gospel. Um, there's going to be a slight change, and it's important to see that change so you can get at the theology. What he's saying is that in the, um, here at the beginning of Mark's gospel is that a messenger goes before the face of Jesus. Watch though the real quote from the Old Testament. This is from Malachi 3.1. And it's stitched together with Isaiah 40 verse 3. And the word that they have in common is the way. The way. We had a whole reflection on the way when we were looking at um, the, the the Via Crucis, right? The way of the cross. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, it says. But this is in Hebrew. How do you say before me in Hebrew? Derek lefanai, the way to my face. That's the way of the Lord. The way of the Lord is the way to prosopumu, in Greek, they translate this, the way before me? No, the way to my prosopon, to my person. In Greek, when you would wear a mask in the theater, you'd call that mask a prosopon. This is the word that gets used for personhood um, in, in philosophy. Prosopon is where you get the word person. So what is this way that John the Baptist is proclaiming in the desert. It's the way to God's face. That's the journey that we're all set out towards. The end of that road will be the face of Jesus. I think that's an extra layer of meaning that, that we should keep in mind. Because Jesus will show his face in glory to the disciples on the Mount of Tabor. And that's when they see, look at Matthew's language, he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun. We're in Exodus 24. We're in Mount Sinai, when Moses went up with his three companions, and God was so radiant that Moses' own face became shining. And so the people had to veil themselves. It was too much. They were afraid that they would somehow get punished or, or, or suffer because they were in the presence of God just when they were in the presence of Moses. Well, now, too, God's plan is reaching its climax, and Peter, James, and John are entering into the glory cloud, and they, too, are sharing in the glory of the only beloved Son, the one who came to reveal God's face. This is an image of our spiritual journey. But it's not always a glorious face that we see. 
Jesus is going to be praying Psalm 31 when he's on the cross. And what kind of face will we see there? We'll see it's the hour of glory, to use John's language. My hour has come, glorify your son. And it's anything but a transfigured face. It will be a disfigured face, we'll see then. But look what Jesus is praying, Psalm 31, where he says, into your hands, Father, I commit my spirit. It goes on to say in that psalm, make your face shine on your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. So we're, we're waiting for the face of God to shine on us. God, this is Jesus entering into our longing. We are unsatisfied. We are like, how long will you hide your face? Jesus enters into solidarity with sinners, and he'll even say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It, it seems that he feels something of this alienation. I don't know what, I can't imagine what that's like, given the fact that he is God himself. But mysteriously, this is what Jesus is doing, entering into the consequences of sin, dealing with those consequences, but not from a distance, but getting down and dirty, untying the knot that Adam tied by entering into that knot. Make your face shine. Well, it's not shining just yet in glory of the resurrection, but there is the glory of divine love that we see on the cross. And, and yet, when just before he gets to that moment of pain, it's before Caiaphas that we read this, that they cover that glorious face of Jesus with a spit, and they strike him, and they mock him. What we learn through that is that the way of the Lord, the way to God's face, is nothing other than the way of the cross. The cross leads us to the glorious face of God. This is the way of the Lord. So you got to read the transfiguration behind that. Remember, transfigured glory flanked by passion predictions to tell us that this is all one thing, just like on the shroud. The glorious face is the one that suffers. All right. Our hope for heaven. Paul speaks of heaven in just these terms. A beautiful chapter. Some have said it's the, the most beautiful chapter. Remember, it begins, love is patient, love is kind. You know, he said, if I had all the, um, the eloquence to, to speak in, in tongues, etc., but if I had not love, I'd be like a noisy gong. I'd be nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not irritable. Love bears all things, supports all things. But then at the end of that chapter, he says this, for now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I've been fully known. That's what it means to see God face to face. To know him, to see him as he is, just as he sees me for who I am. Interpersonal communion. That is our heavenly home. And this is the end point of salvation history, to see God face to face. And so, is it God who's hiding? Is it God who's veiled? No. The veil lies over our own eyes. This is exactly why the bride in uh, uh, the marriage ceremony is the one who's veiled. And then the veil is lifted so that there is this interpersonal communion as the two become one flesh. Look at the language of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, which compares the Old Testament to the New. The ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, think of the tablets, right, on Mount Sinai. They came with a certain glory, but with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory. Wow, was it glorious. But is it the fullness? Not even. Look what he goes on to say. Will, the, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? So this is an argument a fortiori, right? Man, if that wasn't something that we could take, how much more glory is there now? And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. We're being transfigured from glory to glory. Not when his hiding 
not when he comes out of his hiding place, but when the veil is lifted from our eyes so that we can see beyond um, these natural eyes. We can, we can see the divinity. Not because he has changed, he's unchanging, but so that we can be in such a place that we can understand what, what we're looking at. We need a divine grace. We need a transfiguration, a transformation. We need a new creation. All right, so it's not just that this thing, like we need, I don't know, uh, a makeover. No, we need to be totally remade ex nihilo, right? Out of nothing. That's the language of God when he says, for God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, think of the fiat lux of Genesis 3. He spoke and it happened. There was darkness, now there's light. How does this verse get applied? To us, to the human heart. And out of this darkness, light will come. Will be completely remade. And this is the language. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so the end point, and this is the last biblical slide of uh, the scriptures tonight, is from Revelation chapter 22. You'll remember the new Jerusalem, the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? This is a great Easter reflection. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. Jesus said in the Gospels, here I'm thinking of the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you are the light of the world. But wait a minute, I thought Jesus said, I am the light. So which one is it? We participate in his light. We're little candles. He's the source. But there will be a day when we enter into such a fullness of glory that there will be no need of lesser lights because the Lord God himself will be our light. That's our destiny, to shine with his own glory. Can you imagine what he has prepared? No, you can't, is the answer to that question, says Paul. He says, you know, has it entered into the, to the mind of heart? How's that go? No eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has prepared for those who love him. In other words, as soon as you begin to imagine it, you can be sure that your imagination falls short of the fullness. I can, I can only imagine. That's a, that's a beautiful song that speaks exactly of that verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. That they will see his face, face to face. And so the catechism explains this in abstract terms as beatific vision. What is beatific vision? That always confused me, that language. This is what Benedictus Deus said in the 14th century, that those souls, the ones who die in God's friendship, they see the divine essence with intuitive vision, that is, without any mediation. Or of any creature. How do we speak metaphorically of direct vision, face-to-face -face vision? That's what that metaphor was constantly getting at. There will be a day when you don't need anything between you and God. The divine essence will be yours by an intuitive vision. You'll just know who he is. You'll see him as he is, just as you are fully known. And that is the deepest longing of the human heart. And so we call this perfect life with the most holy trinity, the communion of life and love uh, with the trinity, that is heaven. So what do you think about when you use that word? You know, going to a garden, right, where there's all kinds of fruits, a kind of blissful paradise. The essence of it is this. We see him face to face. We see him for who it is. This is the ultimate end and the fulfillment of the deepest human longings, the state of supreme and definitive happiness. It's what everyone's looking for. And so blessed are we if in this face, what we look upon is the face of God because that's an icon of everything we're made for and how little time I spent speaking about this, and perhaps it's the most essential point, 
that you just need to, after all that learning about the shroud and even about the scriptures, you come to a moment where you just silence your inner voice. As St. Teresa of Avila would say, contemplative prayer is like coming before God and saying, I'm just a blank canvas. You silence your voice, you silence your thoughts, and you let him, who is the divine artist, speak to your soul. That's what happens when you come before this face, as he fills us up, he, we rest in his presence. And so I can't help but think of what uh, a pope, ooh, which pope was it? I think it was Paul VI, who in 1973 said, speaking of the shroud, how blessed are we if Zacchaeus climbed a sycamore tree just so that he could get a glimpse of Jesus passed by? If those Greeks came to Philip, who then turned to, to Andrew and said, we want to see the Lord, right? Or think of Philip, who said to Jesus himself, Lord, show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. What did Jesus say? Have I been with you so long, Philip, and still you do not know me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. What's your best window into seeing God the Father? Jesus crucified, died, buried, risen from the dead. All of that, I believe, is contained in this image. If you would just have the eyes to see. And so I'll close with a song, and then maybe we can have some com uh, a conversation about this if you have some good questions. But this song was written by my friend and confrere. We enter together in the seminary. He's from Australia. His name is Father Stephen Howe. And the most beautiful fruit, I think, that ever came of one of my shroud tours was that Brother Stephen went home and he wrote this magnificent ballad, and it's called God's Face. We've said a lot. I think this will help us rest in the mystery and just take in all of the divinity that shines through this humanity, all of the divine love that surges through this human face. I just invite you to um, sit back and contemplate now this face as we listen to this song. Who is this man I hardly see shouted in silence speaking to me Why is his story told in blood and light What did our gods do down to right What will I let him I see the nails, I see the blood, my tears go forth in a cleansing flood. Why did my Savior choose these chains for me, if not that I should be set free? So come on Lord and let me see. I do believe that I perceive God's face before me.
Oh 